Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Primary supporting arm of American infantry, from the era of muzzle loaders to atomic projectiles, is the epical story of field artillery, the king of battle. Today on The Big Picture, we're going to tell this story. It begins at Bunker Hill and has grown in importance ever since. Until right now, the hard-hitting, fast-moving field artillery team is the most powerful army unit on the battlefield. Let's watch the story of artillery in action. through history, it has always been the man on foot who has taken and held the ground. But seldom has he been alone. Today, many weapons support him in his ground-gaining mission. And the most powerful is artillery. The word goes back. A platoon is pinned down. A concentration of enemy is discovered. A regiment needs support before jumping off. All along the battle line, the communications network passes the word for artillery. Foxtrot, Oscar Bravo, fire mission, coordinates 67523, azimuth 490, enemy concentration will adjust. And artillery is delivered. But let's go back to the beginning of American artillery. Let's go back to 1776. This is the cannon that fought with Washington, a muzzle loader that had to be swabbed after each round to ensure that no sparks would set off the next round prematurely. A primitive weapon, but good enough to pound the British at Bunker Hill, support the successful attack at Trenton, and aid in the defeat of Cornwallis at Yorktown. was often ill-equipped, but it fought its battles and it won. And in the conflict, American artillery was born. By the time of the Civil War, artillery had increased both in size and power. At Gettysburg, the decisive battle of the war, artillery played a dominant part. On the third day of the battle, the Confederate General Pickett led a furious charge against the Union Center. The Union artillery opened up with shot and shell. In 30 minutes, Pickett lost 5,000 men. The South never recovered from Gettysburg. This was the last of the dashing hell-bent for leather horse-drawn artillery, for World War I revolutionized the whole concept of artillery. years, two huge armies hammered each other across a shattered no-man's land, neither able to penetrate the other. In such a situation, artillery became the primary weapon. Its development was rapid. The telephone enabled commanders for the first time to really exercise control over artillery fire. artillery became so potent that infantry could move only with difficulty. Armies couldn't maneuver without exposing themselves to withering artillery fire. 
the war settled down to a stalemate movement was the problem movement of both men and guns as one american artillery officer put it however easy it may be to move guns about on a map to do so in a country congested by troop movements over broken ground with poor roads requires much thought time effort hardship patience tact and system movement was the problem any army must move to win but in the rain soaked fields of france general mud took command of all forces almost all operations became effectively bogged down As the war progressed, trucks came to replace horses as the prime mover of artillery. But the problems still remain. For each gun moved, there had to be a movement of personnel, ammunition, spare parts, repair agencies, rations, and general supplies. And sometimes, just moving the truck was hard enough. The problems were complicated further by the huge proportions that field guns were achieving towards the end of the war. Often 16-inch guns mounted on railroad tracks were used to support front-line operations. It was the Allied Meuse-Argonne offensive that finally broke the back of the German army. Although artillery contributed to stalemating the war, it also contributed to the victory. In fact, huge numbers of American artillery played a dominant role. Over 1,500 pieces of artillery were massed along a 16-mile front. A tremendous barrage preceded the attack and continued intermittently during the day. It was the 1st of November, 1918. By 7 p.m. of that day, all objectives had been achieved. The American army had rolled forward an unprecedented five and a half miles over a land shattered by artillery. For the first time in the history of warfare, artillery caused more casualties than any other weapon on the battlefield. Massed fires were employed for maximum destruction. In World War I, 70% of all casualties were due directly to artillery fire. The king of battle had earned his name. With the end of the war, the American army came home, and Americans settled down to a generation of uneasy peace. Then came a new word, Nazi and behind it a new face, Adolf Hitler. Under Hitler, Germany was recast into a totalitarian military state with ambitions that stretched around the globe. Here in America, President Roosevelt signed our first peacetime draft bill. Americans of all shapes and sizes got ready for war. And two years later, at a place called Pearl Harbor, war came.
In World War II, we found ourselves fighting in two major theaters on opposite sides of the world, and men and equipment had to get to both places. To most everybody, a Pacific Isle was a beautiful, happy place. But the Japanese warlords changed all that, and we had to put things right again. Although Pacific Islands may have once been beautiful, in a war they are tough to fight on. Movement again became the big problem, particularly for artillery. For the most part, ammunition and supplies had to be lugged over jungle trails on human backs. And as always, when General Mudd takes command of operations, everything bogs down. But wars don't wait and the American army learned to move and fight in the jungle. As before, artillery became the primary supporting weapon. In fact, artillery gained new prominence in the Pacific. It became the most effective weapon against the by charge of the Japanese. fuse and new techniques of fire enabled guns all up and down the front to concentrate their fire on one spot at one time. Banzai charges were stopped dead in their tracks. firepower, the key to success in battle. And this is the result of firepower, enemy destruction. From island to island, the American army fought forward and finally won. But at the same time, Halfway around the world, in the deserts of North Africa, American forces were fighting another phase of the same war. The desert created its own problems, but it was open terrain, and it allowed the American army to employ its mobility and firepower, with airstrikes aiding the artillery. Hill 609 will long be remembered. The key to the German defense, it took a terrific pounding from American artillery. Finally, it fell. The German army in Africa was no more. Tunis and Bizerte rejoiced, but across the Mediterranean lay Italy and a town called Anzio.
direct fire artillery helped secure the beachhead. Then, up the rocky spine of Italy, the American army advanced, fighting for the high ground, moving up the valleys, and always with the support of artillery. At a mountain bastion called Casino, the Germans made their strongest resistance. Artillery pounded their positions around the clock, and when the infantry took anything, there wasn't much left. But Casino was the strong point of the German line. The Air Force teamed up with artillery to smash it. In Belgium and France, the American army made spectacular progress. Then came the German counterattack. It was here, during the European campaign, that a new weapon came into use against the Germans. Massed rocket fire. This is firepower. This is the result of firepower, surrender of the enemy. As in World War I, artillery continued as the king, the most powerful weapon on the battlefield. Out of the chaos of the Second World War came imperial communism. The free world got a taste of its aggressive intent in a little country called Korea. Way outnumbered from the start, American commanders traded manpower for firepower, and once again, artillery came to dominate the battlefield. The weapons that fought the Korean War were basically the same as in World War II, but the technique of gunnery was vastly improved. Using a simple target grid system, any infantryman could become an artillery observer. He could call for fire support, and the artillery could deliver it rapidly wherever it was needed. Word comes into fire that Charlie Company in the attack is pinned down. Information on the position of the enemy weapons and placements is plotted. Then, this information is cranked into the guns. Charlie Company needs artillery support and gets it. The men of Charlie Company wait as friendly shells walk overhead. After the first barrage, range and azimuth are adjusted, then the command is given. Fire for effect. The hill is quiet now. The chatter of machine guns and the dull thump of mortars has stopped. The men of Charlie Company move out and up and secure the hill. Firepower once again has played its part in the victory. And this is the price of firepower. Millions of empty shell cases. Grossly outnumbered in Korea, we traded manpower for firepower and fought the communist armies to a standstill. But artillery can never rest on past performances. And today, perhaps there are more new developments in artillery than ever before. Today, true mobility has been added to firepower to make for flexible artillery, able to meet the modern concepts of battle. Here, ammunition is air delivered to an artillery battery in the field.
But supplies and ammunition are not the only things that can be air delivered by helicopter. Here, a battery commander gets his orders to move to a new position, 20 miles away over rough mountainous terrain. How many hours or even days will it take? Today, in the modern American artillery, it can be done in a matter of minutes. If artillery is to live on the atomic battlefield, it must have this capability of rapid movement. This may look like a piecemeal operation and the hard way to move a gun from here to there. But artillery is heavy, and for the sort of transportation this gun is going to get, it's easier to take a little at a time. The gun carriage goes first. Gun crew next. The whole battery is on the move at once. The copter that carries the crew also totes the gun barrel. In a matter of minutes, they will be in action again, 20 miles away. And this is the terrain they are bypassing. Here's a little fellow, a brand new addition to your Army's firepower family. No, it's not a tank but a light, highly mobile, 90 millimeter gun. Maneuverable and fast enough to be hard to hit, light enough to be transported by air, and with a punch big enough to knock out a tank. This is the new, self-propelled 90 millimeter gun. Here's the Big Bertha of your Army's conventional artillery, the 280 millimeter cannon, capable of battlefield maneuverability with its twin tractor units. It also is capable of delivering an atomic punch to an enemy many miles away. This is the most powerful finest example of conventional field artillery in the world today. But today, there is a revolution in artillery concepts, weapons, and strategy. These small rockets of World War II have grown up to become a major source of firepower on the modern field of battle. Here, a corporal missile lumbers into position. Capable of ranges greater than conventional artillery, and capable also of accurate delivery of atomic warheads, Guided missiles like the Corporal, Honest John, and the Redstone have brought a new concept to the battlefield. No longer can an army concentrate its strength to launch the offensive. 
No longer is there safety in massed numbers. Any massed concentration of strength now is an open invitation to destruction by atomic missiles. And with the atomic missile, the artillery, now as never before, certainly is the king of battle. Mobility coupled with devastating firepower. That is the knockout punch of America's new artillery. That is why today, more than ever before, the artillery has earned the name King of Battle. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center, presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.